The earliest sets in the Pokemon TCG were home to many powerful Pokemon that defined the early competitive metagame. So today we're going to get some of the best Pokemon from the game's first generation sets. Starting off at number 10, we have Hitmonchan. This 70 HP Pokemon can use its jab attack to deal 20 damage for a single fighting energy. For two fighting one colorless energy, Special Punch deals 40 damage. While this card would be wholly unimpressive by today's standards, many of its aspects made it one of the best attackers for aggressive decks back in the earliest competitive formats. Firstly, 70 hit points meant that Hitmonchan was tanky enough to survive multiple attacks from other aggressive Pokemon. Against the commonly used Scyther, Hitmonchan had enough HP to survive two slash attacks. 70 hit points also allowed Hitmonchan to survive multiple attacks from the widely played Magmar, Electabuzz, and itself in a mirror match. Hitmonchan's attacks were also very efficient at the time. Jab dealing 20 damage for a single energy attachment allowed the card to quickly rack up damage from the very start of the game. Since the rules of the time let you attack on your first turn, a 1 energy cost attack lets you put some pressure on your opponent's Pokemon for very little investment. As an efficient attack for only 1 energy attachment, Hitmonchan played well with and against energy denial cards like Super Energy Removal, a card which could be devastating for certain decks with its effect to discard 2 energies from an opponent's Pokemon at the cost of discarding 1 energy from one of yours. Hitmonchan's type also aided its ability to threaten early KOs on many meta-relevant Pokemon. As a fighting type, its attacks dealt twice as much damage to the aforementioned Electabuzz and Wigglytuff, allowing for a two-hit KO without any other damage modifiers. Himonchan's type was so effective at hitting opposing Pokemon for weakness that the card became a staple in aggressive strategies just for that purpose. Himonchan was so influential that some cards had a significant portion of their competitive viability determined by how well they matched up into the fighting type. Scyther, for instance, saw play in a slew of strategies as its fighting type resistance meant that Jab would deal zero damage to it. Widely played psychic type Pokemon like Mewtwo also give Hitmonchan problems as its Cyburn attack would deal 80 damage and one hit KO the fighting type due to its psychic weakness. Even so, Hitmonchan's ability to very efficiently threaten colorless and electric type Pokemon made it a meta game staple in the earliest tournaments. Although the card would fall off in play sooner compared to other cards of this list, its reputation for those earliest days makes it a great card to start this list off with. And at number 9, we have Blastoise. This stage 2 Pokemon had the Rain Dance Poke Power in the Hydro Pump attack. Rain Dance allowed you to attach as many water energy cards from your hand to your Pokemon as you liked during your turn, allowing the player to get around the usual restriction of only attaching one energy card per turn. And for 3 water energy, Hydro Pump would deal 40 damage plus 10 more for each water energy attached to Blastoise that didn't pay for its energy costs. What this meant was that Blastoise with 5 water energy attached to it would deal 60 damage with its Hydro Pump. Also, Hydro Pump couldn't add more than 20 extra damage with the effect, so it was capped at 60 damage. Rain Dance gave Blastoise strategies a legitimate niche over other popular decks in the metagame. Since you could attach as many energies as you wanted during your turn, Blastoise decks got to utilize powerful cards which couldn't see play in other decks. Most notably, Articuno, a Pokemon that saw zero play outside of Rain Dance decks, as it was very weak against Super Energy Removal discarding all of your energy attachments, which was a vicious threat when easily powered up in a single turn with Rain Dance. Freeze Dry gave Articuno a chance to paralyze your opponent's Pokemon, which meant it couldn't take any actions including attacking during your opponent's next turn. Paralysis is the strongest status condition in the Pokemon TCG, as it denies your opponent's Pokemon a chance to do anything. Since Articuno had a respectable 70 HP body, your opponent not being able to attack after using Freeze Dry made that card deceptively difficult to KO. If you wanted more damage over utility, for 4 water energy, Blizzard dealt 50 damage to defending Pokemon, and then you flipped a coin. If Heads, it also dealt 10 damage to all of your opponent's Pokemon. If Tails, it dealt 10 damage to all of your bench Pokemon instead. Regardless of the downside, 50 damage was enough to two-hit KO a majority of Pokemon in the metagame. Although Rain Dance decks were very powerful once set up, they often had a lot of issues getting to that point. Since Blastoise is a stage 2 Pokemon, you had to evolve Squirtle into the stage 2 over multiple turns, or with a trainer card Pokemon Breeder over a single turn. Squirtle was also exceptionally vulnerable against Electabuzz, which hit Squirtle for its weakness. Although this strategy could stumble in the early game and never quite recover, if you got Blastoise set up, it was a force to be reckoned with. This strength meant that Blastoise saw competitive play, a bleat not exactly top tier, throughout all of the earliest metagame. And at number 8, we have Erika's Jigglypuff. The most relevant part of this card is its Pulled Punch attack. For 2 colorless energy, Pulled Punch dealt 40 damage, plus 30 less if Erika's Jigglypuff had any damage counters on it. With double colorless energy, you could use this attack for a single energy attachment. An attack that dealt 40 damage for a single energy attachment was unheard of at the time. It made Pulled Punch one of the strongest moves in the game. However, the attack's downside of dealing massively reduced damage if Jigglypuff had any damage counters on it 
meant it could only be truly abused in a specific strategy, those looking to win the game as early as possible. Backed up by incredible draw trainers like Bill and Professor Oak, players on these strategies could dig through their deck on their first turn looking for hand disruption cards such as the Rocket's Trap to get rid of all the cards in your opponent's hand before they get to play. While looking for hand disruption, draw plus powers boosted pulled punch damage by 10 for each plus power until the end of the turn. This damage modification allowed Erica's Jigglypuff to KO Pokemon with an HP as high as 80 on the very first turn of the game, all while making it impossible for your opponent to play on their turn. Since you could attack on your first turn, if your opponent only started the game with one Pokemon in play, Erica's Jigglypuff could win the game on your very first turn with a massively powerful pulled punch. Even if you couldn't KO your opponent's Pokemon immediately, leaving them low on resources often meant that Jigglypuff wouldn't deal any damage, allowing high-powered pulled punches for the next turn as well. Although its use was fairly one note, these decks were a very real threat in their format that every single player had to prepare for. And at number 7, we have Mr. Mime. This Pokemon's unique Poke power gave it a valuable niche in the earliest metagames. Invisible Wall prevents all damage dealt to this card if it would deal 30 or more damage. For one Psychic and one Colors Energy, Meditate will deal 10 damage, plus 10 more, for each damage counter on the defending Pokemon. Invisible Wall could make Mr. Mime extremely difficult to deal with for many strategies if they relied on high-powered attacks. Some Blastoise decks had no good way to get around Invisible Wall, since all of its main attackers dealt 30 or more damage with their attacks. If a Blastoise player wasn't using cards like Lapras, which could deal 20 damage to the Tydro Pump, the best card they could have against Invisible Wall is Squirtle. While your opponent struggled to deal damage, Meditate's own damage output would increase over the course of the game as your opponent's Pokemon got more damage counters. Meditate's scaling damage, while starting off slow, meant Mr. Mime would often deal 40 to 50 damage with a single attack, something unheard of for only two energy. Mr. Mime also played well against Mewtwo, one of the best Pokemon in the early days of the TCG. Since Mewtwo's only attack Cyburn dealt 40 damage, the card couldn't damage Mr. Mime. Mr. Mime also dealt twice as much damage against Mewtwo since it had a psychic weakness. This weakness meant that Meditate would always two-hit KO Mewtwo as the first attack dealt 20 damage and the second would deal 60. Being a fantastic counter to one of the best cards in the game at the time made Mr. Mime an excellent card in psychic type decks. While it matched up well into many strategies, Mr. Mime's low 40 HP meant that any opponent able to get around Invisible Wall's damage potentially could easily KO the card. Magmar, a widely used Pokemon in aggressive strategies, had two attacks which completely ignored Invisible Wall. In particular, Smog could actually KO Mr. Mime through Invisible Wall if their opponent won a coin flip and got the poison on the Mime. When a Pokemon is poisoned, you have to put one damage counter on it in between turns. This meant that a Smog which poisoned functionally dealt 30 damage on your opponent's turn, and the remaining 10 damage needed for the KO after your turn. Mr. Mime was also incapable of damaging the powerful colorless Pokemon dominant in the metagame. While Wigglytuff might struggle to attack through Invisible Wall on its own, its pre-evolution Jigglypuff could with no problem as its psychic resistance meant Mr. Mime wasn't able to damage Jigglypuff at all. Mr. Mime also couldn't do anything against Lickitung, one of the strongest cards in the game's early history. Even with this weakness, Mr. Mime's potential upside of being game-winning on its own made it an excellent Pokemon in the game's initial metagame. And at number 6, we have Muck. This card's toxic gas Poke Power prevented players from using any other Poke Powers while Muck was in play. This card is the original ability lock effect something many players find frustrating as it can disrupt many strategies revolving around Poke Powers. Muck saw competitive play for this same reason. Sometimes your opponent wouldn't be prepared to play under the effect of Toxic Gas. While there weren't too many decks completely reliant on using Pokemon powers in the metagame, with exceptions to Blastoise and Brock's Ninetales, there were many rogue strategies and utility Pokemon played in more meta decks that were used specifically for their Poke Powers. Cards like Mr. Mime and Ditto were wholly reliant on their Poke Powers to fulfill their unique utility roles. Since Toxic Gas affected both players, people using Muck had to build their decks around not using any Poke Powers. Cards like Mewtwo and Rocket Zapdos provided great damage output, regardless of Poke Powers. Another common partner was Lickitung, whose Tongue Wrap ability could paralyze your opponent's Pokemon for added disruption. Ironically, the prevalence of many strong Pokemon without Poke Powers meant that Muck wasn't always a great card to include in a deck, even if you relied on no Poke Powers of your own. Just because Toxic Gas was bad in certain matchups, it didn't mean the card was unusable. If Muck was strong in a given matchup, it can often be game-winning, something many players at the time found worthwhile. Marking the halfway point at number 5, we have Scyther. This card is synonymous with the early competitive formats of the Pokemon TCG due to its efficient offense and utility. For one Grass Energy, Swords Dance makes a slash attack used by Scyther during the next turn deal 60 damage. For three Colorless Energy, Slash dealt 30 damage. Much like Hitmonchan, a card commonly used alongside this card, Scyther was a very efficient attacker that was easy to slot into many strategies. Thanks to Slash's energy cost being entirely colorless, Scyther could utilize double colorless energy to more easily power up its attack. The colorless cost also meant that any deck could use Scyther for its utility. 
Being a Pokemon with a fighting resistance meant it completely walled off opposing Hitmonchan. Then, if your opponent switched their Hitmonchan to a Pokemon more apt at damaging Scyther, Scyther's free retreat cost allowed you to pivot out of the active spot for no cost into a more favorable Pokemon. Even ignoring its utility, Slash dealing 30 damage for two energy attachments was good, especially if you got to use Swords Dance the turn before to double its damage output. If you got to use Swords Dance, then a single plus power made Slash deal 70 damage, a crucial benchmark for KOing many basic Pokemon at the time. Scyther's fighting resistance made it pair exceptionally well with many colorless Pokemon that are otherwise threatened by fighting types. Wigglytuff makes an excellent partner to it as it also utilizes double colorless energy, and can play grass-type energy cards for Scyther's Sword Dance. Since both the colorless attackers and Scyther required no particular energy types, these decks also get to play whatever attackers they feel needed. Usually, this means a plethora of psychic types, such as Mewtwo, to give the deck even more offensive capability. Mewtwo's Cyburn also complemented Slash very well as a combination of 40 and 30 damage set up a two-hit KO on many commonly used 70 HP Pokemon. Scyther was so widely usable that many players of the older formats used Magmar and Aggro decks to attack Scyther for weakness instead of generally stronger attack options like Electabuzz. And at number four, we have Wigglytuff, a card mentioned throughout this video due to its great synergy with many of the best cards in the game. For one color's energy, Lullaby puts a defending Pokemon to sleep. While a decent utility option, this attack wasn't the reason Wigglytuff is one of the strongest offensive threats in the Pokemon TCG's first formats. For three colors energy, Do the Wave deals 10 damage plus 10 more for each of their bench Pokemon in play. With a full bench of five Pokemon, Do the Wave could deal upwards of 60 damage. With a single plus power, Do the Wave one hit KO'd almost all basic Pokemon commonly used in the metagame. Much like Scyther's Slash attack, Do the Wave was easy to set up thanks to double colors energy. Do the Wave was the strongest attack possible for only two energy attachments in the game's earliest formats. It was this unmatched efficiency that made Wigglytuff such a potent offensive threat. Being able to take one-hit KOs without attacking for weakness with a Stage 1 Pokemon was a very valuable trait that drew many players towards Wigglytuff decks. Also, due to double cost energy, Wigglytuff played better into super energy removal than many other high attack cost Pokemon at the time. Since you could power up Do the Wave in two turns, your opponent wouldn't have a chance to use super energy removal to discard two energies from Wigglytuff before you got a chance to attack and possibly get a knockout. Many strong set of Pokemon were stripped of any viability due to super energy removal's existence, so having your cards matched up well into it was a vital part of deck building. Outside of the excellent attack, Wigglytuff also had excellent defensive utility in a format dominated by psychic type Pokemon. Since this card had a psychic type resistance, Mewtwo's powerful Cyburn only dealt 10 damage. In a pinch where you couldn't get enough energy attached for Do the Wave, Lullaby putting any Pokemon to sleep could buy Wigglytuff player an extra time to set up. Its defensive shortcomings could easily be patched up by including other attackers like Scyther. Wigglytuff strategies were also some of the most flexible in the early TCG, as the card could be paired alongside anything. Its most common pairing was Scyther and Mewtwo, although other combinations were also meta viable. Some players opted for many Pokemon which could apply early pressure like Hitmonchan, Electabuzz, and Magmar. Sometimes players included Muck to shut down opposing decks reliant on Poke Powers. Other builds of Wigglytuff included a plethora of hand disruption cards like Rocket Sneak Attack and the Rocket's Trap. For being one of the most flexible strategies and a powerful attacker, Wigglytuff easily earns its spot on this list. And at number three, we have Rocket's Zapdos. This card was both a fantastic card in the early game and a threatening late game cleaner capable of knocking out a full HP Pokemon with ease. For one electric energy, Plasma dealt 20 damage and made you attach one electric energy from your discard pile to itself. For three electric and one colorless, Electroburn dealt 70 damage at the cost of Zapdos dealing 10 damage to itself for each electric energy attached to it. The Plasma attack is what really makes Rocket Zapdos such a great card. Having an attack on a basic Pokemon that dealt 20 damage for a single energy was enough to make some cards viable on their own, as it lets you deal solid damage from the very first turn of the game. As a basic Pokemon, Rocket Zapdos Plasma dealt a respectable 20 damage for a single energy with an additional upside, something unheard of at the time. It wasn't a bad upside either, as the energy acceleration lets you work towards powering up Electro Burn without demanding your once per turn energy attachment. Getting electric energy in the discard pile for Plasma to reattach was trivial thanks to trainer cards like Professor Oak, Computer Search, and Item Finder. Plasma also let Rocket Zapdos use super energy removal with little to no cost by reattaching whatever energy you discarded for the trainer's cost. Plasma similarly let Zapdos players recover any energy cards lost to opposing super energy removal. This resilience to energy removal cards makes setting up Electro Burn very reliable. Regardless of the self-damaging downside, 70 damage for a single attack was fantastic letting Rocket Zapdos one-hit KO many prevalent threats in the metagame. The self-damage can also be somewhat mitigated with cards like Defender, 
A trainer that reduces all damage the attached Pokémon took by 20 until the end of your opponent's next turn. This damage reduction includes attacks made by the attached Pokémon, so Electro Burn could deal as little as 10 damage as Zapdos, a downside much more reasonable than 30 or 40 self-damage. Rocket Zapdos is such an iconic Pokémon from the earliest days of its history that it received a commemorative reprint in the 25th Anniversary Sat celebrations. And at number 2, we have Mewtwo, one of the most important Pokémon in the game's first generation format. For one Psychic Energy, Energy Absorption lets you attach two Energy Cards from your discard pile to Mewtwo. Then for two Psychic and one Colors Energy, Cyberm deals 40 damage. In the base fossil format, a popular retro format which includes the first three sets of the Pokémon TCG and some promo cards, Mewtwo using Energy Absorption to attach two Energy Cards to itself on the first turn is one of the strongest plays someone can make. Putting two Energy Cards into the discard pile was trivial with the likes of Computer Search discarding multiple energies while searching any card from your deck that you may need. By setting up three energies on your first turn, you could use your following energy attachments from your hand to power up new attackers while you dealt a potent 40 damage with Cyburn every turn. With Cyburn setting up two hit KOs on many of the format's basic Pokémon, a powered up Mewtwo represented a significant threat from the very first turn. Energy Absorption also gave Mewtwo the same resilience and synergy to and with energy removal cards that Plasma gave Zapdos. While Mewtwo had no resistance and thus no real defensive utility, its offensive prowess was so significant that early metagames were warped around Mewtwo's presence. Mr. Mime saw play in large part thanks to Mewtwo. Mew became a popular tech option due to its Psywave attack dealing 60 damage to a powered up Mewtwo, meaning a single plus power could round out the KO for only a single energy. Colorless Pokémon that resisted Psychic like Wigglytuff and Lickitung were also made significantly better due to their favorable matchup into Mewtwo. Its Psychic typing also meant that cards with a Psychic weakness became far worse than if Mewtwo hadn't existed in the format. With many Fighting-type Pokémon pushed out of the format due to Mewtwo's typing, Colorless Pokémon became even better. As previously mentioned, Mewtwo had great synergy with Wigglytuff because the latter could use Psychic Energy to power up its attacks. Generally speaking, in the early history of the Pokémon TCG, your deck needed to either use Mewtwo or have a good plan against Mewtwo in order to be successful. However, there is one other card which is even stronger than this meta warping Mewtwo. And taking the top spot on this list, the best Pokémon from the first generation sets is Lickitung. This Pokémon only has one relevant attack. For one colorless energy, Tongue Wrap deals 10 damage and you flip a coin. On head, the defending Pokémon is now paralyzed. While the attack is functionally shared with Electabuzz and its Thundershock attack, what sets Lickitung apart is its massive 90 hit points. Out of all of the six sets from the first generation of Pokémon, 90 HP is the third highest HP stat for a basic Pokémon, only behind Chansey and Brox's Onyx. With an enormous HP and a 50% chance to paralyze your opponent's active Pokémon with each attack, Lickitung is an extremely difficult Pokémon to KO. Hitmonchan's Jab Attack only deals 40 damage with weakness, only 3 hit KO in Lickitung without any other damage modifiers. Lickitung also has the ever-important Psychic Resistance, so Mewtwo can barely damage it. Not even the powerful Wigglytuff can get a 1 hit KO, giving the Lickitung player a turn to remove their energy card with Super Energy Removal. Even if he got close to knocking out Lickitung, the player could just scoop it up back into their hand and then promote a fresh, undamaged Lickitung to the active spot. Although Tongue Wrap only deals 10 damage at a time, this card's incredible difficulty to be KO'd means that 10 damage adds up a lot over the course of a game. As a colorless Pokémon, Lickitung also gets to take advantage of a wide array of partner Pokémon. This card's most common partner is Scyther to complement its fighting weakness with a fighting resistance. Lickitung Scyther decks also get to use a powerful suit of Psychotype Pokémon due to their colorless attack costs, often opting for Mewtwo's and Mr. Mime. Some players also use Chansey as another high HP, hard to KO Pokemon that could potentially deal massive damage with its double edge attack in the late game. There's also some Lickitung decks that try to win the game through stalling your opponent until they have no more cards remaining in their deck. These builds use cards like Muck for additional disruption and Moltres for its wildfire attack that puts cards from your opponent's deck into the discard pile. What's really interesting about Lickitung's history is that the cards saw very little play when it was released. It's with people revisiting the older formats and metagames that many players have come to the realization that Lickitung is absurdly powerful. With some players even arguing that Lickitung makes the older formats worse to play overall due to how strong Lickitung strategies are. It's not uncommon to see many tournaments held for the first generation sets being dominated by Lickitung strategies that are insanely hard to deal with appropriately. For being the number one force in the metagame, Lickitung easily earns the top spot on this list. All right, we hope you enjoyed this look at the best Pokemon from the first generation sets. If you think we missed any cards or have any ideas for other videos about the first generation sets, please let us know down in the comments below.